so students the meaning what do you mean by biomass so it is a microbial biomass see whenever we spoke about the single cell protein what did we tell that the single cell protein we usually study that it is used by produce using the microorganisms spirulina chlorella and then it is finally converted in the into the form of tablets which we consume and also we spoke about this lactic acid bacteria which are present in your curd okay which is formulated now into tablets and that can be consumed okay so what is happening you are consuming the microbial product the microbial biomass okay this is the meaning and yeast which you are adding to your bakery products what is it you get that yeast powder that is what it is a microorganism that is your uh saccharomyces which you are consuming so you can see that these microorganisms can be consumed not all microorganisms some of the microorganisms can be consumed so what we mean to tell is in biomass fermentation microorganisms are used to biologically convert biofeed stock now what is this word what do you mean by biofeed stock Okay, I mean by the word bio feed stock. That is, we have certain waste raw materials which are already being processed by other industry. For example, take the case of your your sugar cane, your beetroot. It is used for other purposes. For example, beta lin is extracted from beetroots, and you have the waste product of this. You have already extracted the sugar from your cane, and what you are left with. is with your um, molasses we have plant materials which are lignocellulose so these are all called as a biofeed stock now using this biofeed stock what we are doing it is acting as a nutrient it is not acting it is a nutrient okay this is your nutrient so now what happens your microorganisms are consuming these nutrients and then what is uh, what is happening it is forming into certain products useful valuable products so this valuable products can be in the form of biofuels which you have all heard of okay such as the bioethanol biobutanol chemicals can be produced combustible gas combustible gases can be produced for instance starch what i have showed you the starch and molasses are used as a feed stock to produce ethanol via fermentation during which simple sugars example like glucose maltose and sucrose are fermented into ethanol or biobutanol so this is the entire meaning of your biomass that is you are using the microorganisms which feed on the bio feed stocks okay which are usually the waste of other industrial products so you are using this bio feed stock and it acts as a nutrients for the growth of the bio, microbial organism so that your organism produces a valuable product as i mentioned it earlier so what we told in the beginning i told you that you can consume scp you can consume the tablets like this vsl3 tablets you can consume you can consume uh, the yeast okay these are all organisms so this microbial biomass that is it is which is produced for human or animal consumption 
okay the most commonly used is the single cell protein so using the single cell protein we can get very good amount of proteins remember students this the organism yeast was produced as a food on large scale in germany during the world war 1 okay the first world war itself germany started to produce the yeast in large scale but the concept of utilizing by probably by mass as food was not thoroughly investigated until 1960 but once the people came to know once the researchers came to know that this is one of the best techniques wherein we can scale up the products so since the 1916 a large number of industrial companies have explored the potential of producing single cell protein from a wide range of carbon sources okay it is just not what i have mentioned here almost without exceptions these investigations have been based on the use of continuous cultures as a growth technique so in most of the cases when you are producing a single cell proteins it has been observed you have studied the various type of fermenters like batch fed and continuous what they have found is the continuous culture technique is one of the best method to grow the my your bi microbial biomass and you also have to know that see, these microorganisms these are growing in an inexpensive carbon source okay inexpensive carbon source and can produce valuable products such as the amino acid nucleotides organic acids many types of organic acids are there. lactic acid citric acid acetic acid different types of vitamins which can be added to food to enhance its flavor or increase its nutritive value so you can this like this top line what it tells you is you can use microorganisms and you provide the feedstock for the microorganisms you provide inexpensive ca carbon sources only so that they can use up these carbon sources and produce you a valuable by product which can be edible so this microbial fermentation transforms your sugars generated from lignocellulose biomass to biofuels such as the ethanol butanol acetone isobutanol lipids etc or other value added biochemicals like organic acid exploiting fungus yeast or bacteria so what do you mean by this sentence is you are exploiting the fungus yeast or bacteria to know more about them so that they can bring you the value added products so the livestock waste and food residues discharged from your household and food related industries what are these these are all the wastes which are released these are usually organic matters your food materials whether from it is from the house or from the food industry okay the waste biomass is composed of inedible parts of agricultural products such as the logging residues rice straw rice husk okay we just eat only the rice not the paddy husk or straws we don't eat them and they will be adding again to the waste right so it is used for the energy and environmental clean up so what this means to tell you all is like whatever the waste product whether let it be the household waste product or even the agricultural waste products okay these can be consumed by your microorganism so that it can get sufficient amount of nutrition to produce value added materials so resource crops used to produce bioethanol biodiesel fuel from where you are getting this all you are getting these all by your plants crop plants like rape seed corn rice are applied in environmental clean up of bio phyto remediation
So whatever the waste which we are producing, okay, these waste can in turn be used as a nutrient by your feeds for your microorganisms to once again produce and useful products as we have mentioned it earlier. So coming to our SCP, see the single cell protein have a very competitive price in the protein market. Okay, especially of vegetable origin. You know that most of the people don't eat animal product, which is also rich in the proteins. But if you really don't consume the animal product, then if you need, if you are in need, your body is in need of proteins, then obviously you can go and eat such type of single cell proteins. So it is essential to guarantee efficiency along all stages of process whenever you're producing your single cell proteins you should make sure whether at any stage of your production all the stages should guarantee the efficiency of the product that is it should be of the best quality there should not be any inferior or impurities that should be not be present so what are we telling in particular the carbon accounts for up to about 60 percent of the operational cost what did we tell you're using carbon as a nutrient source for these organisms so what happens is what they have observed the researchers have observed this 60 percent of the carbon what is used by this microorganism is from the waste products okay so it adds up to the 60 percentage of production operation cost because you have to take so much carbon items materials as your feedstock for this microorganism to grow so it becomes very costly because you have to have so much amount of feedstock for providing carbon for this microorganism to grow. So what happens? 60% of the production itself is going for the utilization of the carbon as a source material. So it is a costly process. Therefore, you have to think, I mean, as a researcher or an industrial, you'll have to think that when you're spending 60% of your money just for your nutrients for your microorganism you have to see that the end product what you're getting it should be of a high yield of substrate conversion okay so you are providing your microorganisms with the carbon sources and that is adding up to your cost you have to get back whatever you have invested I can get back whatever I have invested only when I get my end product, which is of high yield. Okay, it should be of high yield. That is, it should have better substrate conversion rate. Okay, the substrate should be well converted into product. Okay. So this is the substrate conversion. So when your substrate conversion is high, automatically whatever the end product you're getting, the yield is high. And this can make up the cost. So that is what I told that high yields of substrate conversions are required. High productivity process must be implemented and utilization why you think over instead of spending 60 percent of my investment on these materials just for carbon sources can i use something which is inexpensive material but remember if you are going to go for an inexpensive substrate as a carbon sources it is good because these waste materials whatever i told the molasses or the lignocellulose or your sugar beet okay they are already used up for their products 
in other industries and there is they act as a waste okay simply take the example of sugar cane which you are more aware, aware of it the cane is i mean the sugar is extracted from there what is left is the molasses okay all the starchy material is left out i can take this starchy material and use it for my microorganism growth to produce some other products right so what is happening the substrate cost is coming down the substrate cost is coming down at the same time another important thing is now your microorganisms can easily assimilate the carbon sources okay they can easily consume this carbon sources which are broken down into simpler form but this should be guaranteed by the researchers and the in industrialist if you are going for an inexpensive product carbon sources it is up to you to guarantee us and see to tell us that this product is fine the end product is good okay it is consumable so when we are speaking about the single cell protein students remember that there are many strains which can be used for the production of single cell proteins in when we are using it uh, for example i have given bacteria as an example like brevi bacteria chlorella is an example for algae candida is an example for yeast fungus is an example for aspergillus fumigates or you can use aspergillus niger so all these can be used for the production of the single cell protein okay so now to assimilate now what is my main point okay i have selected this organism as a single cell protein production organism now what should i do i told that we should provide the carbon sources apart from that you require nitrogen minor elements such as the phosphorus okay potassium sulfur magnesium etc trace elements vitamins are these are all adjusted according to the general composition of the carbon source based on these carbon sources you have to add all these nitrogen phosphorus whatever we have mentioned so this in turn whatever the nutrition you are providing no this in turn is highly dependent on the this entire nutrition what we are speaking is highly dependent on what type of strain you are selecting are you using a brevi bacteria chlorella candida fungus or any other bacteria because all do you think the composition of nutrients of all this organism is same no so you should choose what type of organism i am choosing for my experiment and what type of carbon and nitrogen sources i can provide for them so that they can act upon the substrate and provide me the valuable product so the simple nitrogen sources what we are using is in the fermentation industry is the urea okay ammonia nitrate these are used to keep the cost down phosphate is supplied as in the form of phosphoric acid or as a soluble phosphate salts so look at this this is the fungi this is then yeast this is an algae this is a bacteria all this can be used okay the strains you have to select the strains but because will that strain is suitable to consume that particular substrate and produce your value added product in the large scale industry production <laughs> so whenever we are talking about fermentation fermentation variables are very important so you have to kindly look back to my previous videos to understand this all what is the temperature what is the ph what is your what is the ionic strength level what is the level of oxygenization 
what type of fermenter you are using mostly i'm using the continuous fermenter what is the dilution rate all this have a strong influence on your cellular yield this in particular you have to remember all these variables why we tell it variables see for example temperature or you take ph okay are you keeping the temperature constant for all microorganism in, in the fermenters no it changes according to the organism what you are using the ph also some will be sustaining in alkaline some in acidic some in neutral so these are called variable products whether it is a temperature your ph your ionic strength the oxygen what you are producing the dilution rate and what type of fermentation you are using these all are variable it can change and also remember students whenever you are you are using aerobic metabolism okay that is whenever you are using aerobic organism you require abundant supply of oxygen when you supply abundant amount of oxygen aerobic metabolism can occur in higher growth rate but also you have studied that oxygen has low solubility okay the oxygen has low solubility in the media it is not easily soluble but your aerobic organisms can take up this oxygen only when it is in the dissolved form okay but unfortunately our oxygen solubility is poor in the media so what we do has we have said it earlier we go for aeration that is air sparging agitation so this increases your growth of your biomass okay the aerobic organism when you are providing aeration agitation it is getting good amount of oxygen now but don't you think it is adding to the cost of the fermentation okay your you you have to use a sparger you have to use the cost of the aeration is because of the air sparging the agitation this all in turn is increasing the scale of operation resulting in an important technical challenges so these are all you can see that these are challenges faced in the fermentation industries and your idea is to see that as an industrialist how maximum i can use inexpensive materials or standardize the procedure without compromising your end product result only then you will get back your profit you should at any cost should not compromise on your product it should be of a high quality high yielding product so also you you have to sustain the oxygen transfer rates larger air volumes have to be supplied through high agitation so what the scientists have now come out is because of this problem that is the solubility of oxygen is very poor so they have come back come with an idea telling that why to go and use any other fermenter there are many type of fermenters and so they are telling that it's better to use continuous fermenter using air lift type of fermenter which you have studied please go back to the videos previous video sorry air lift external air lift and internal air lift type of fermenter you are going to use why the importance of this is we have already spoken because it doesn't require any agitation there is no impeller okay only because of i'll show you the picture then i'll explain it once again so so these are the standardization process what we can look into for now students for any production of 
whether it is SCP or your yeast biomass production, the first step what you have to remember is the selection and screening of microorganism. Select the best microorganism. Screen that microorganism, whether it is producing the best, whether you have chosen the best tree, that becomes the important step. Only when you go for the selection and screening of the microorganism, that is, you're doing it in the laboratory. Only then you can see that which organism can take up which type of or assimilate which type of carbon, which type of nitrogen or phosphorus or any other nutrients and then convert it into your valuable products. So this first process is always done in the lab scale. Okay, After by using a shake glass method or in the laboratory fermenters we use. So I am not particularly interested in the lab scale. My aim, of course, selection of your uh, selection and screening, you have to do it in the lab scale only. But my most important point is what I want to produce it in large scale, scaling up. The last video is what you studied to produce in more number. So between your laboratory scale and your industrial scaling, what is that? Pilot plant is scaling is there. So you grow the organism, optimize your organism, see which feed it can use, and then directly don't take your microorganism and put it into your industrial fermenters. Don't go for large scale fermentation. Just go for the pilot scale. Pilot scale is acting an intermediate between your commercial scale fermenter and your laboratory scale. So what is the function of the pilot plant scaling up? It is just not SCP I'm talking in general. In general, see, to produce biomass for animal nutritional trial, it can be used. Instead of going and trying it in uh, 20 liter, 20 hundred lakh liter or 10 lakh liters vessel fermenter, I can use smaller fermenters right which is about 10,000 or 50,000 liters I can use it and see that what type of nutrition trials can be done so that I can use that biomass for the animal as a food to provide scale scale up data for design of production scale plant so finally after I have done all optimization i'll go for commercial fermentation commercialization of the product so for commercialization what should i do i do I have to do a design i have to do all the optimization and standardization in the pilot scale itself so that after going to the commercial scale i need not do any trial and error there if you do trial and error in your commercial scale it is everything is gone you will not get your product, you will not get your money also, what you have in, invested. To check the stability of the organism on large scale continuous culture in terms of yield and product specification. So what can be the yield? What can be the product specification? If I'm using a particular type of fermenter, a particular type of organism, what is the yield I'm going to achieve? What is the product I'm going to achieve in my large scale? That is should be checked in the pilot scale itself. Whether the organism is stable, everything you should do in the pilot scale. So you see the pilot scale is acting as an intermediate between the laboratory scale and the commercial scale, which I already told. So to develop, check and modify alternative harvesting procedure so students harvesting procedure is once your product is formed you have to remove that product extract that product and that is why we use the word harvesting okay that is a downstream process again i am repeatedly telling you all the downstream process will be explained individually in detail to compare the organism performance with the obtained in the laboratory fermenter so what i'm going to do whatever product i'm harvesting is it sufficient 
amount of centrifugation, filtration, or any other uh, HPLC flocculation method, is it all okay? What you are using? Does it justify your experiment? That one you are doing here. You are checking and if it is not justifying, then you are doing the whatever modification is required in the pilot scale itself. And to compare the organism performance, you have taken the organism which you have grown it in the laboratory scale and whatever the best output it has given your, your organism, it also should give your best performance even in the pilot scale so that I can go in for the large scale production of my biomass production. So there are two types of fermenters what we'll be studying. One is the submerged fermentation and another is the semi-solid state fermentation. These are the two methods which are commonly used for your growth of single cell protein. So, submerged fermentation, what do you mean by submerged fermentation? Submerged fermentation is one where the substrate, okay, the substrate to be fermented, who's fermenting? Your microorganisms. So, the substrate which is to be fermented is necessarily placed always in the liquid containing nutrient needed for the growth of the organism. So you're placing your substrate in a liquid containing nutrient media for the growth of your microorganism. So this substrate, when you add microorganism to here, the microorganism will act upon the substrate and it will fermentate. It brings about the fermentation. So this is known as a submerged fermentation because your substrate is submerged into the liquid containing nutrients needed for the growth of the organism. And the substrate is held in the fermenter that is, it is operated continuously. This is an important point. It is operated, your fermenter is operated continuously and simultaneously biomass product is complete, uh, continuously harvested. So we already spoke about continuous fermentation. What did we tell? You are going on adding your nutrients, your microorganism and simultaneously you are removing or you are extracting your, you are harvesting your end product. Isn't it? That is what we studied about the continuous fermentation. So continuous fermentation is the type of fermentation which is used in the SCP production. So finally, after your product has been produced, what they do? The product is further filtered, centrifuged and dried. This process has a higher operating cost. So what we do is we have got a product now that product should be purified how i'm going to purify it is by these various methods okay i can use the filtration method centrifugation method or i can dry it then coming to your semi-solid type of fermentation the substrate preparation is a simple solid waste. You can just use cassava waste or any other waste that is known as semi-solid fermentation. That is your substrate. What I have given the example is your cassava waste. So as I told you that we can use these two methods, submerged fermentation and semi-solid fermentation method for producing the single cell proteins. But remember, I also told that the product, whatever the product you are extracting, 
okay that is by using this filtration or centrifugation and drying this product uh, purification or downstream processing is again once again costly so after this what you have to remember is the basic steps involved in the single cell protein production what are the points you have to remember production of suitable media containing proper carbon source that is an important point you should have a proper carbon source next preventation of contamination of the media and medium and the fermenter i told you that fermenter should also be sterilized so there should be no contamination of your medium and no contamination of your fermenter production of appropriate microorganism that is what we told that is the selection and screening of your microorganisms and finally is the separation of your microbial biomass and processing so these are the important basic steps involved in your scp production whether it is in small scale i mean it is in the laboratory scale or in the pilot scale or in the large scale, larger fermenters but remember one point i have put here in large large scale or commercial commercial scale fermentation the process of scp production involves some engineering operation like stirring mixing multi phase system multi phase system means are you using a single phase like liquid or liquid liquid immiscible phase or solid liquid gas liquid this is known as a multi phase system what is the heat transfer what is your heat transfer coefficient what is your mass transfer coefficient what is your oxygen transfer this all you must and should know for an operating the fermenter during the large scale okay and how much of oxygen is required what is the aeration you are providing i mean of course oxygen how you are providing through the sparger but now we told that even we can use airlift fermenters also so these all parameters we have spoken individually in the previous slides i mean previous videos so another important point is students and see here i have provided a flow chart of how this uh, fermenters are been uh, fermentation of scp is carried out okay see this is the substrate you put the substrate into the fermenter and you have to add the nutrients then fermentation will occur by the process of the microorganism then you will get your product that product can be filtered it can be dried and you will get a single cell protein either you can use submerged fermentation or semi solid fermentation now why are you saying that continuous fermentation is better starting itself we told that why come continuous fermentation is better so the scientists or the researchers have come to a conclusion wherein they have verified whether continuous fermentation is better or batch fermentation is better for your scp production so single stage continuous has good economic advantages over your batch fermenter process pr productivity is unquestionably higher in the continuous culture the process whatever the process is product product is formed it is higher in your continuous culture contamination can be problem but may be solved with the development of secure system adequate mon monitoring devices and high standard design and engineering so contamination can be a problem because this system is running just not for one or two days for many days it keeps continuously running so there can occur certain the instrumental can shut off suddenly or any other physical or mechanical problem it can face so what is important is a adequate monitoring of your system is important 
what is happening in the system what is happening inside the fermenter you can't open and see but now whatever you're using is it is a digital digital uh, fermenters which is attached to the computers okay so the computer have their own algorithm which will tell you that what is the aeration what is the oxygen transfer which is occurring what is the speed of your impellers what is the temperature oxygen ph is it foam is being formed everything it shows you that and accordingly you can vary it by just a click of a button in this way continuous fermentation process can operate monoseptically for many thousands of hours the carbon and energy source is completely utilized in continuous culture so the carbon and energy source from wherever the molasses or lignocellulose the or the sugar beet whatever you provide it it can be completely utilized leaving only very small amount of waste products okay so there is no problem for the environmental problem is not there that there is a very little waste state of substrate or the spent medium after the cell recovery product specification from continuous culture is more uniform in continuous culture whatever the product you are getting it is more uniform than what you are obtaining in the batch culture here why because it is a continuous process you are running you are not stopping you are harvesting you are ha uh, adding the nutrients but in batch fermentation once you have put all your nutrients switch off your batch culture then remove your materials i mean the products again go for sterilization again start with the fresh batch culture so there may be product specification variation in your batch culture but that cannot happen in your uh, continuous culture and finally adjustment of medium composition and concentration of the growth limiting nutrient are easily accommodated so if you want to adjust your composition of the medium or the concentration of the growth limiting nutrient this we spoke in chemostat continuous fermentation we spoke about the chemostat and we to spoke about the turbidostat and there we used this word growth limiting nutrient everything can be accommodated in your continuous fermentation so continuous fermentation can be described as a stable and self regulating process so this is the best way wherein you can produce your single cell protein so one of the important operation in single cell protein production is the aeration so who i told you which are the two parameters which are involved in the highest heat generation it is your microorganism heat is generated in the cultivation process and it should be subsequently removed by cooling devices okay so what happens whenever you are going for your fermentation is lot of heat is being generated because the microorganism itself starts generating heat and then what happens it is adding to the extra heat so this should heat should be removed and how are you going to remove that heat by using the cooling devices you can use the cooling devices and you can uh, reduce the heat if heat is generated in higher rate without proper removal what will happen it is more likely to affect the survival of the microorganism inside your fermenter okay if the heat is generated and if you are not removing the heat properly without using cooling devices it is ultimately going to kill your microorganism which is present in your fermenter then harvesting harvesting the produced microbial biomass involves major concern Uh, consideration as i told you your filtration or centrifugation or drying these are all very costly process so single cell organisms are usually recovered by a process known as centrifugation particularly your yeast and bacteria filtration 
with appropriate membranes. There are different type of filtration methods, students. The different type of membranes also available. So filtration with appropriate member is used, particularly when your biomass is a filamentous fungi. Okay. So centrifugation for yeast and bacteria. If that is a filamentous fungus, you go for an appropriate filtration. So the major portion, okay, that is uh, the water content from the media. When you're running the fermentation, what is that? Media is the media is your nutrient, and there is a lot of water content. This should be removed in the early stages itself. Early stages of your fermentation itself, it should be removed as much as possible. Otherwise, the drying becomes a very difficult pro problem because if water is that high humidity or high moisture content is that, then automatically what contamination from the microorganism can inferior microorganism can happen that is why maximum you'll see to that you remove the water in the early stages as possible final drying of the product must be carried out only under clean and hygienic condition the final drying whatever you're doing should be done under the clean and hygienic conditions so, Again, this is another flow chart I have uh, here in, in this flow chart, you can see the previous flow chart was that of submerged fermentation and semi-solid fermentation. But now the flow chart what I have put is the airlift fermenter. Okay, why this airlift fermenter? I told you that in airlift fermenter, the question of oxygen is that impeller the agitation that is not that to sustain high oxygen rate large air volumes have to be supplied with high agitation rate right which is adding to the cost therefore alternative fermenter designs include airlift type this is an airlift fermenter which achieves maximum oxygen oxygenation with minimum power requirement because whenever you're using aeration air air sparger or your agitation impellers what it requires it uses more electric current again adding to the cost so you use airlift type fermenter continuous airlift fermenter so that it can produce you maximum oxygen for your organism and reduce the power requirement, diminishing the aeration cost. So the largest fermenter ever operated is an airlift fermenter. This is an example wherein you have studied about this word protein. Protein is a single cell organism which is commercialized. Okay. And the capacity of this fermenter is 3,000 cubic meter. Imagine the size. Okay. So this is particularly used for the aerobic production. So here I have uh, put a flow chart showing that how airlift fermenter is used for the production of the single cell protein. See, we use ammonia, methanol, salts, phosphoric acid. What are these? all your nutrients ammonia is a nitrogen source okay so carbon sources salts we use phosphoric acids we use you all put them all sterilize the media put them into the air lip fermenter your air lip fermenter maintain the ph at 6.8 temperature at 31 to 37 degrees centigrade any fluctuation in the temperature you if i mean as the heat is generated switch on your cooling jacket after that what flocculation that is once the product is formed how you have to harvest go for flocculation go into for centrifugation go for spray drying grinding and what you get you get your single cell protein that is the protein okay there are different type of single cell proteins which have been produced i have taken an example for the protein production how they have done it in the air lip Fer fermenter so what is the organism they have used is the methylophilus methylotrophus inoculum this is the organism they have used you supply ammonia methanol acids and salts and here is a cooling jacket to cool your fermenter if it is getting highly heated 
and what type of airlift fermenter is this continuously operated pressure sky cycle fermenter that is see the air itself what it does it it lifts all your nutrients and microorganism up and down circulation manner and then what you do after the product is formed cell separation you se separate your biomass from that of the media or water whatever you have to get only the biomass here and then go for flash drying okay dry this cells grind it into a powder powder form so you're using flash drying so that you get the granules here also you can go for packaging but then you can go even for grinding and then it will form a powder form and you go for the packaging of the final product whatever water you have recovered here it is can be used for media preparation again you sterilize again use it for the uh, production of your uh, protein or your single cell protein so this is about the entire procedure of the single cell protein remember this you have to select the type of strain and by screening process it is done in the laboratory scale directly don't go and use commercial scale method use your pilot scale method wherein the operation parameters are optimized and then go for the commercial scale so you can use bacteria yeast or fungi or algae for the development of the single cell protein and it is a continuous fermenter okay because we showed you the difference between the batch fermenter and continuous fermenter which clearly shows that your continuous fermenter is far more better than your batch fermenter fermentation uh, fermenters whatever you are using and particularly such type of airlift fermenters are more better because it can reduce the agitation cost and the cost of purging the air so with this we come to the end of this section wherein we have spoken about the single cell protein production using how we are scaling up them okay and what is the fermentation method we are using so submerged fermentation semi solid fermentation but it is should be in a uh, continuous mode the better one is go for the airlift fermenters and you have to remember all this precautionary measurement basic step what is required for your fermentation and why you are using pilot scale why it is acting as an intermediate i told between your commercial scale and your laboratory scale okay students with that we shall wind up today's class thank you